at www.va-itsnetwork.org. In order to ensure that everyone can hear this webinar, your line has been muted. However, we have a chat box that you can, um, that's located on the left bottom side of your screen that you can see there. We are so excited that we have 306 people registered to join us on this webinar. Um, throughout the webinar, again, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions about what's being discussed in that ch chat box on the left. Some of you guys are already utilizing it, I see. Um, so if you have any questions, just, um, just type in there. Um, if time allows, we'll surely answer any of the questions or as many of the questions as possible. If you experience any technical difficulties throughout the webinar, simply type those difficulties into that same chat box. And Christy Amos, our technical support for today, will help you out with those as much as possible. Throughout the webinar, we ask that you answer the poll questions as they come up, again, in that same chat box. When we get to that portion of the webinar, we'll instruct you on how to do those. At this time, I would like to introduce my fellow um, Infant and Toddler Specialist Network uh, specialists that are located throughout the state. As I had said previously, my name is Leslie Floyd Ward, and I am the Infant and Toddler Specialist in the Piedmont and Roanoke region. Also joining us today is Crystal Hauser. She is the specialist uh, located in the Peninsula region. Uh, we have Jamie Morris, and she is out of the Valley region. And finally, we have Lee Lawhorn, and she is um, close to me here in the Piedmont, but she is the South Side region. So we welcome all of you guys. We also have a, um, a speaker that is joining us to share her expertise. Um, her name is Molly Zarsky. Molly um, is a physical therapist and is the owner and director of Albemarle Therapy Center with state-of-the-art facilities located in Charlottesville and Waynesboro, Virginia. Her organization provides physical speech and occupational therapy for children throughout the region. She has 30 plus years of experience in the field. Um, she graduated from Thomas Jefferson University with a bachelor's in physical therapy. Molly is a SIPT certified specialist, and she's early intervention certified and CM2. Molly is a master coach um, using the Early Childhood Coaching Handbook. Uh, Molly sees clients in home through early intervention, um, and she is working through the Infant and Toddler Connection of Virginia. So we are so excited to have Molly here with us today to show, um, to talk to, us, talk to us and share with um, us some of her expertise. The purpose and objectives for today, we're going to define modern material. We have so many things at our fingertips now, so we're really going to get into that and um, define those new materials. Define the container baby syndrome, also known as CBS, and the developmental effects of those on infants and toddlers. We're going to discuss relationships between child care programs and CBS. And finally, identify practices to prevent CBS, which again is defined um, as CBS stands for container baby syndrome. So now I am going to um, pass it over to one of the other specialists, and they're going to get um, us started sharing some more information on modern materials. Okay, I should be unmuted. Hi everybody, this is Crystal. So we're going to go over modern materials. So for the purpose of this training, modern materials are going to be used interchangeably with containers. So some examples of those would be bouncy seats, vibrating seats, bumbo seats, um, boppy pillows that you might see in your young infant room, car seats, out. so this is for outside car rides. We're not talking about as parents are, you know, transporting back and forth or our family day home providers would be transporting back and forth, nothing like that. 
um, high chairs in the feeding positions, other other feeding position systems. Again, this is outside of feeding time. This is this is not what it's typically used for. Um, extra saucers. Walkers, those are the ones that can have the wheels on the bottom that you kind of move around. Jumpers, those fun contraptions that have the um, bungee cords on them. Uh, swings, um, those can be side to side or front to back. And then strollers, again, not used outside of moving, you know, transporting children or going on walks. So we're going to be talking about those. For the purposes of this training, modern materials are going to be used interchangeably with containers. So we're just going to do a quick survey, and we're going to talk about what modern materials are you presently using in your program. So for these survey answers, it can be the seats, the car bouncy bumbo vibrating seats, the high chairs, the swings, it could be the walkers, or jumpers, or exercisers, or strollers. So the, what you're currently using in your program and the most that you have. So we're going to give you guys a few minutes to respond. I see people, okay, seats are, are very, oh, okay, seats and high, and high chairs are, um, which makes sense because we need um, those as we are moving about the classroom. Walkers and strollers are going to be. I'm going to give you guys just a few more seconds. Thank you for participating, everybody. Great job. All right, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to close the poll. And our results, okay, so what modern materials are we using? In our programs, we're going to be, the majority of them are seats. So car seats, bouncy seats, bumbo seats, or those vibrating chairs um, with a second place coming in high chairs, right? Because we've got to feed the baby somewhere, so we're going to talk about that. Um, and then swings, uh, I'm sorry, exercisers, the walkers and jumpers, those come up next. And then swing. So we still have some, some uh, results trickling in. So we really appreciate you guys um, taking the time to be here and taking the time to put that information in. So without ado, I'm going to turn it over to Miss Molly. Hello. Um, welcome to today's webinar. And so happy to hear that there are so many people who love babies as much as I do, and want to promote their um, development. As a physical therapist who has worked in the Infant and Toddler Connection in Virginia since 1990, I have seen the influence of container baby syndrome. Typically on my caseload, I carry two to three children who are influenced by the container baby syndrome. This is thousands of dollars spent for my care of these children um, due to container baby syndrome. Container baby syndrome is defined by the American Physical Therapy Association. Um, is the name applied to a range of conditions caused by the infant spending too much time in a container, such as a stroller or car seat. Conditions can include mo <coughs> move can include movement and behavior problems and even deformity. Container baby syndrome came about at the onset of the back to sleep program when parents and caregivers were fearful of placing their child on their tummies to play on the floor or in play plans due to concerns regarding SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome. Also, the baby equipment industry boomed with various ways to entertain babies. Parents and caregivers felt the need to have the equipment to make the babies happy and, th and th that they were doing a good job by having all this equipment. So today we're going to have, gain an understanding of what specifically happens when babies are left in containers. Um, so I'm going to define them in three different categories. The semi-reclined devices such as swings, bouncy chairs, and infant seats. Exosaucers, walkers, jumperoos, bumbo chairs, and bucket swings. Research has shown that children that have been left in containers for too long will eventually catch up unless there's an underlying condition going on. This underlying condition can be low muscle tone or hypotonia, torticollis, which is a twisted neck or tightened muscles on one side of the neck, or a neurological or genetic disorder. We're going to look at each different piece of equipment in regards to the following, posture, 
development, behavior, and vision. As a pediatric physical therapist, the, um, the I believe the foundation for movement is to have good posture. So we want to promote good midline control and core strength with the head aligned over the shoulders and trunk and pelvis to have a good foundation to be able to move, to sit, to balance, and to stand and get in and out of positions effectively. When a child is limited in their ability to move and explore, they will develop behaviors such as um, being complacent or have sensory seeking behaviors. We've all seen that little one who just wants to move and bounce and bounce when they hold them. Um, or the child that just sits and does not want to move or just lay there on their back and not know how to get up. The effect of it on their vision can be that they have not it, they have limited movement <clears throat> and the ability to um, look from one side to the other, and so their tracking skills can be affected. So here, in regards to semi-reclined equipment, car seats, bouncy chairs, infant seats, and swings, what I have seen with children, that they can develop a head tilt, that gravity takes over, and the child will tilt their head to one side, and they'll rotate their head away. This promotes a postural torticollis or positional torticollis or contributes to the tendency of congenital torticollis. The definition of postural torticollis is if the child develops the torticollis, the twisted neck, from just being kept in one position for extended periods of time. The congenital torticollis is when the child is born with the torticollis. This is due to positioning in utero when there is excessive tightness on one side and excessive stretch on the other or weakness on the other side. The child will have a rounded back and falls to one side. So here in this picture, this baby is tending to fall onto the side and has a rounded back. So one side is shortened and the other side <clears throat> is elongated. Tends to kick with one leg more than the other. So let's talk about plagiocephaly and torticollis. So here are sweet little babies here. Um, so what um, I'd like you to do to understand what torticollis is, is I'd like you to um, take your hand and place it on the right side of your neck behind your ear, and then bring your other hand, your left hand, down to your sternum and clavicle. Then I want you to side bend your head and feel that muscle pulling into your, protruding into your hand. That is called the sternocleidal mastoid. The sternocleidomastoid, sterno meaning the sternum, clido meaning clavicle, mastoid meaning the mastoid area of the jaw, is a muscle that side bends towards itself and rotates away from itself. By, by being in that semi-reclined position, the child's head will fall to that one side. So here, get my little pointer out. See how the child's falling into the side, shortens on this side, and that the child's, this leg is freed up. Notice that the child, in this particular picture, the child's hands are out and not coming to midline. So in this picture over here with the baby with the helmet, the helmets are used to treat um, plagiocephaly. Plagiocephaly means um, mouse-shaped head. This child has a flat spot here and probably has a flat spot. Oh, no, he has, I'm sorry, this, I just got this picture. Um, take that back. So the flat spot is probably back here because they're doing opening of the helmet back here to allow the head to expand um, outward like that. Notice this child has a smaller eye and the right cheek is protruding. So you can have deformities from laying in on their backs from one spot more than the other.
So what are the effects of child, children being placed in a semi-reclined position for extended periods of time? So they may use one side of the body more than the other. They don't turn their head as easily, and they don't know how to push with their arms. So they tend to use their arms more for play, like batting at toys or holding toys, bringing toys to their mouth. So they're good at doing that, but they don't know how to, to push with their arms um, and push up onto a, um, into a prone prop or extended arms and come up to sitting up to the side. And they'll have neck, shoulder, back, and hip weakness. So I, when I'm treating these babies, I have to teach them how to push. Um, and I use various techniques. And sometimes when the babies don't want to be on their tummies, um, at first I had just have to slowly work them into being on their tummies. I'll just even teach the parents how to push back on the baby's arms um, in a sitting position and then slowly bring them onto the mom's chest. Um, or on their lap, and I um, touch certain muscles, the pecs, um, lift up with the pecs, and then that'll activate the arms to push. Um, and so and it, um, because of their weakness through their shoulders and around their scapula, it takes them a while to figure that out and to, to get organized about how to do that. So how it affects their behavior. The babies don't like to be on their tummy because they can't see. They're so used to being um, in a semi climb position and being able to look around their environment. Um, so they don't like to be on their tummies. They depend on the equipment to go to sleep, decreasing in their adaptive behavior of putting themselves to sleep. And they, they like sometimes they'll be like to be bounced more for stimulation because they don't know how to move. So like we talked about before, that they get into that... Um, and they go to one side, and one leg then is um, freer than the other, and then they just start to bounce, and they'll get using one leg more than the other. In regards to baby's um, vision and how that can be affected by being in a semi-reclined position for too long or developing a torticollis um, in particular, so they're not able to visually track and turn their head from side to side as easily. And with the plagiocephaly, they'll often get a point in the back of their head. They get a ridge, and so they can't roll over that back part of their head. So that's the purpose of the helmet, because the helmet provides a round surface for the child then to turn their head, as well as providing the change in the actual shaping of the skull. Um, and they'll visually regard one hand more than the other. So like in that picture of the baby that um, side bent to the right and look towards the left, they would regard that left hand more than regarding the right so that they w wouldn't have as good midline control. And bring those hands to midline transferring because they would have a decreased regard for that side. So moving on to jumperoos, walkers, and exercisers, let's look at what happens with the posture. So the children um, will use one side of their body sometimes more than the other. So what happens, and I'm going to just point out, this baby looks pretty much in mid midline, but sometimes they'll slump to one side if they're shorter on one side, and they'll just bounce on one foot more than the other foot. And so then they get that shortening, if they're, particularly if the child's too short for the jumper row. So they get contractions of their calf muscles from pushing up on those toes, and shortening of that one side. They also, because there's um, jumperoos have, and I, this not down underneath, as you know, there is like a sling, and there's one point where the child in between their legs, where the pelvis sits, and um, they'll get excessive stress on their hips and pelvis at that point of sitting on their back, um, in, versus sitting on their bottoms, back, or tummy. So I wanted to tell you a little story. Um, about a child that I assessed, um, and um, the, the service coordinator called me about this child, and um, t the child was seven months of age and was referred for global developmental delay. The doctor was concerned because the child tended to go up on his toes and cross his legs. This is a pattern seen in children with cerebral palsy. So we went out to the screening, 
uh, I'm sorry, the service coordinator went out to the screening and the parents reported the, the child was in a walker for eight hours per day due to animals being in the home that they did not want to put the child down on the floor. <clears throat> so the service coordinator recommended to take the child out of the walker and see how well they did um, and place them on the floor or in a playpen or any on the bed with supervision, just anywhere that they could get out of the walker and experience other things. And she made a deal with the with um, the parent that just use the walker when you need to get something done. Although I'm not a fan of walkers at all, but sometimes you have to make compromises. So I came in about after three weeks for an assessment, and the child was beginning to sit, rolling, and pushing up on extended arms. He had gained three months worth of skills in three weeks. The child was still scissoring, so we recommended to continue to take out of the walker, and they, they began to work with this, uh, a great developmental specialist who worked with the child, and the child eventually caught up. But it was just an example of how children can develop movement patterns that are abnormal and look like other conditions just by being placed in um, an upright um, position such as a jumper room, walker, or extra saucer. So developments, how does these jump roos affect development? Research has shown that children who are in the upright equipment are usually one month behind other children. They can use one side of the body more than the other, particularly if too short, they tend to lean to one side, and they, become, they can become toe walkers <clears throat> because they're unable to weight shift over their feet and get tightness in their calf. Muscles. In regards to behavior and vision, they preferred to be upright versus on their tummy, side, or back so that they can see around. So they do not move their body. So they, when they get placed down, they're kind of stuck because they're not sure what to do with their bodies. And they like that increased vestibular activity, vestibular meaning the inner ear, your balance mechanism, the bouncing up and down, um, and don't know when to stop when they put into standing. So. So when you take a child who's been upright all the time, and that's what they're used to doing, and then you try to place them down, their head has to change the position from going being upright to then coming down. And those little canals in their inner ear are then stimulated in a way that they're not used to, and they can become disoriented and stressed. So they have difficulty with body awareness and orientation in space. Also, I've seen um, children, when you place them after being in jump roos for extended periods of time will um, not know how to stand. So you stand them up and they just want to jump and jump and jump. And it takes me a while to get them to calm down and we work with the parents about how to get them to take pressure through their feet to calm themselves down and to understand that their legs are there to support them and not to bounce and teach them how to strengthen their legs. So I understand there's a question here. So we have, so when should we put, so we should never put the baby in an extra saucer. Okay, so um, in regards to um, putting, um, using um, extra saucers, I would say um, I tell parents and caregivers um, to use extra saucers sparingly and to use it only when you're absolutely necessary, such as some parents will talk about, I need to take a shower, um, I need, or caregivers, if you have you know, multiple things going on and you're gonna put them in for a short period of time. But they do not promote development. Um, I think they entertain kids and that they like to be in them. And so that's, I would just use it very sparingly if you're gonna use it, but I, um, Uh, is what would be my recommendation. Okay, so pl the question was, please go back one slide when you have a moment. Okay, so the so here is it the one you wanted with development. Research has shown that children who are in upright can, are usually one month behind. Um, 
use one side of the body more than one other. If they are too short, they tend to lean to one side, and then sometimes they can become toe walkers and unable to weight shift over their feet. This, um, when Sometimes when kids are first put into walkers in particular, they'll tend to push backwards, and which promotes a lot of extension in their bodies and tends to get them to point on their toes. Um, or if they're jumping, they tend to push with their toes and get those calf muscles tighter. Okay, so um, here I talked about behavior and vision. Um, Drew, am I okay to go on? Okay, so there was a comment here using extra saucers after nur nursing to keep them upright for up to 20 minutes after nursing to minimize spitting up. So, um, so you know, reflux is a definitely on the rise from what I have seen from the last 30 years, and um, I do know, I'm, I'm not sure why, but it does seem to be more prominent. I don't know if people used to just burp their babies or carry their babies more afterwards. I'm not really sure, but I've just noted that. Um, so, yes, being in an upright position afterwards does help the children not to spit up um, as much. But again, keep it to if you if you feel like that's what a particular child needs with reflux, um, or then I I would then you know we need to care about kids' nutrition and and do what we need to do for that piece. Does that help Terry with that situation? So again, just using anything sparingly, um, and and make sure when you're using it that you have a definite reason why you're doing it. Okay, so now I love these questions, by the way. This makes me feel like, oh, you know, I'm just not sitting here with my papers and, and I just love to share and figure out what's best for babies. So um, in regards to bumbos, frog seats with the rounded backs and bucket swings, um, and I have a picture of a bucket swing, and this is a summer, this is a summer super seat. So here's the frog swing, and the frog swing has this, um, again, that point where the child puts all that pressure um, at the bottom of the pelvis, um, and it has a rounded back. This is great for keeping the baby off the back of their head, um, which I'll often use um, if I have a baby with plagiocephaly and the families just can't get enough tummy time, but I use it, again, very sparingly. This is a bumbo seat. Um, everybody fell in love with these when they came out, but the problem with the bumbo seats um, is that they have this dip at the bottom here and tend to bring the upper part of the thigh, um, well, they bring the thigh the up, the, in the femur, the legs will go up like that and dip the pelvis and round out the back. I can draw this. Right, so then they have a rounded back, then their, their upper thoracic, their upper back tends to go into a curve here, and oftentimes their heads go forward. Sorry, that's a big baby's head. So, um, so also, as we all know, the bumbo chairs were recalled, and um, if you do use one, you should make sure you have that belt in there. Um, I do not like this dip in the bottom of the bumbo seat. So what I, if a family just really wants to use one, I compromise and ask them to, or I sh when I say families, I'm used to working with families. I also work with daycare centers. So we make compromises and I'll ask them to put in a receiving blanket in that bottom part right down in there to fill in so it's flatter. So here's the summer super seat, um, and the summer super seat um, does not have that dip in the bottom and is a little bit flatter. Um, so, uh, it, it, so this is a little bit better than the bumbo seat. So these do still promote the rounded backs, particularly if the child is not ready to be into a bumbo or super seat or um, so um, 
you know, they just round those backs out. So you need to make sure that the child is ready to be in there. So I would say when would I would say they would be ready? They have good head control. They've got um, extension throughout their back, um, and these can be used for feeding and, and play, um, but again, sparingly. So here's a picture of a baby in a, um, a bucket swing. And so you can see how this baby's head is tilted here. And the back is rounded. A little hard to see that part. But see how that baby turns their head to one side and side bends and shortens over here on that side. So they tending to lean to one side more than the other, tilting their heads to one side more than the other. And so this baby, if it was awake, would have their visual regard would be over here. Um, the question just came in, why do I hear kids crying in the back? Um, I'm sorry, I'm at the Admar Therapy Center um, in, the, in the office, and we have children coming in for therapy. I'm sorry if that's disruptive. I'm not really sure what to do about that. Um, Does that, does that help? Is it, is it too much of a distraction? Um, again, I'm not sure what to do. All right, so um, the other thing, let me go back one slide here. So what, um, one of the things that um, I just saw today um, and yesterday with babies is that they, um, I saw a baby that was in a, um, the mom had propped them up in a in a boppy seat, um, a boppy pillow in a bassinet, and the baby kept wanting to pull up and overuse those muscles that are in the front part of the trunk. And um, she just kept working and working. And so I also had another child that I saw today, and she has is two and has come from a situation where she was kept in a swing or car seat for extended periods of time. And she does have the uh, mild low muscle tone, but she sits with a rounded back and the tissues in the front of her body um, had gotten tight. So um, she had difficulty anytime she was on her tummy, um, she would cry. And I think a lot of this had to do with the tightness in those tissues that, she, um, that were uncomfortable for her. And then they also impeded her ability to lift her head and extend her back. So the question is, um, can you please be more specific about the amount of time it should be spent in these pieces of equipment? Our team is discussing them, the term sparingly. That that's a hard question. I guess I well, my preference would be for the kids not to be in equipment at all. But if you do need to use equipment, that you have a good reason why you're using it. And so, if you need a time, um, I probably would say, um, you know, maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes, something like that. But making sure you have a good reason why you need to put a child in a piece of equipment. So the other, does that answer that question, Lizeth? Lizeth? Um, and if not, I can go into more detail. Then Ginger asks, would you discourage napping in anything other than a crib? Mm, I'm guessing you're saying, thinking about using um, a bouncy seat or a swing. Um, so my answer would be yes. I think babies should be sleeping flat on their backs. Um, it would be my recommendation. Um, and because like um, we've talked about, I'm going to get into here. Let's move one slide in. Um, Oops, no, no, it's not on that one. But I, when I talked about, well, when I get into behavior, 
Um, so when babies are, you know, relying on this equipment, particularly to bounce or to swing, and then um, they'll rely on that on that movement to fall asleep versus being able to soothe themselves to fall asleep on their own. Okay, so hopefully that helps. Um, so in regards to um, development, um, so we t I just mentioned, you know, children will rely on that equipment verse to sit versus using their own body. So they 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 rely like going side to side, you know, just to hold themselves up versus using that core um, to get themselves organized to sit independently. And they also just prefer to look around. They're big observers um, and um, are more driven by by looking around versus trying to move and um, and often play. So. Um, so here's, um, again, use their arms for playing with toys versus pushing and moving their bodies. And then they get, can get stuck in development and then, um, oh, I'm sorry, this one is in getting stuck in the bumbo seat. So they do decide that they're going to finally move and, you know, they're strapped in this bumbo seat and then they're trying to get out of it and then they kind of, the whole thing kind of falls over. Um, so it it doesn't, you know, after a while it just, the use of that piece of equipment, the, the child, you know, you talked about when to take them out. I would, you know, that is definitely a sign of when to take them out is when they start to um, just want to come out. So the question from Mary is, are the seats okay to feed a child in as long as you remove them right after? Of course, it's just fine to feed a child in any kind of seat because the child needs to focus on eating. High chairs are great places to have children, um, you know, play because there's, there's only so much limited as far as what's supporting them so that they have to develop that balance. So the only boundaries you would have would be um, the tray and the back and the, and the seat versus being squished into a bumbo seat um, or kind of laid back in the frog suite. So it provides a nice stable base for them. Um, you know, and it's also fun for the kids to eat or, you know, do finger painting in their um, high chairs. Our occupational therapists are, will often, you know, work in high chairs to have the kids play in messy food, particularly if the kids don't like to finger feed um, and teaching them. But so high chairs are a good place um, for kids to be. Again, we just don't want to use them. Um, excessively. I've been in daycare situations where, um, you know, high chairs are used as timeout chairs, um, and then that can be a difficulty thing also because um, they associate the high chair with the timeout chair versus an eating chair, and we all want to promote, um, you know, positive times for kids to eat and um, be in a good position. Okay, does that help, Mary? All right, thank you for that question. So in regards to the behavior, um, so we've talked about some of this already. So relying on the movement to fall asleep. Um, children want to flip over the bumbo seats because they don't want to be in them. And um, children who are left in equipment become complacent and their developmental skills are depressed. I often see um, they become great observers and not great participants in their in moving around their environment. They just like when they they do get out, they just kind of sit and watch. Um, but we all need to remember that once if the children don't have any underlying situation, that um, that they'll usually catch up, and it's just a matter of how much time you put a child in a piece of equipment. So as far as vision goes in the um, bumbos and um, summer seats and frog seats, so it doesn't affect their vision. It actually frees up the head to move side to side, so I don't have any concerns regarding that. Um, any other questions regarding that as we move on to Crystal? Okay, oh, here we go. So how long can a child be kept in an upright 
equipment without affecting their physical health? I don't know if I know that answer. Um, um, again, you just have to see um, and watch the child. You know, if you if you start to see the child starting to go up on their toes, um, their calf muscles starting to get big, then um, then you can see it's affecting them. They'll have trouble, like when you bring take their foot and bring it up towards their calf, they'll, they'll probably kind of wince. Um, so that's one of the things I check. Again, I would keep kids for maybe 10, 15 minutes in equipment at a time if you're going to use it. And if you're going to use it, please make sure you have a good reason why you're using that piece of equipment. Does that help? So, um, so how long? So, Hiroma, you're saying when they are crying. Um, I guess I'm not understanding what you what you want. So, to take them out of the equipment when they're crying. Um, well, that's for sure. I guess I'm not understanding your question. When they want to get out, of course. So, you know, if they want to get out and they're showing um, that they do want to get out, then yes, you would take them out of the piece of equipment. But you're also thinking about why do they want to get out and what happens when they get out. So if they, um, if they, you know, it, if they're, you know, just bored and tired of being out in that piece of equipment, then yes, definitely I would take them out and making sure that they have other movement experiences, and we'll get into some of that. All right, so we probably need to move on. Um, so I'm going to um, mute my phone um, and turn this over. Thank you. So another question came up, how long is it advisable to use these equipment? Um, well, I would prefer not to use the equipment at all, but if you have to use it, just remember when, you know, to have a good reason to use it and keep it short as possible. Okay, uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. Thank you for that, Molly. That was great. Um, so what we're going to look at now is our how we're currently using our modern materials in our program. So there's a couple of different options that you can pick. So we're asking you to come in and poll again. Um, number one is safety, two is entertainment, um, maybe it's medical reasons or behavior concerns or just if you need to take a break. So we're going to go ahead and I see responses starting to come in. Thank you so much for that. Um, let's see, we'll give it, give it about. 10 more seconds so everybody can make sure that they are responding. Again, these are in your program currently, um, why you're using the modern materials. So we've got 45 total responses. All right, 47, 48, okay, there we go. The numbers are going up. See, I can see you all. <laughs> Thank you guys again for making sure you're here and participating in this. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now so we can see what our top reason was. All right, so we're going to look at the results. So right now everybody is saying, most, most people are saying safety. Safety is the biggest reason. So um, a lot of people came in on the side too. Um, safety seems to be the number one reason that we are currently using modern materials in our program. So. Um, that is a good, that's good information for us to know, it's good information for you to know, and just as care providers to have that good piece of self-awareness, right, why we're using them, what, what we have them for and why we're using them. Um, number two came up with entertainment. So that's an interesting thing to think about. So as we move into this next segment with Molly, um, just kind of remembering and keeping in mind what your modern materials you're using and then how we can transition into this next phase. All right, thank you guys so much. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll, and we will transition into safety. All right, thanks so much, guys. So that was really helpful information to know about safety concerns. 
So I'm just going to, um, I will get back to that, but some of the safety concerns regarding using um, modern materials um, regarding jumperoos, um, I have seen jumperoos being turned over, and I've also seen children that um, have gotten so good at that jumping that they can actually hop the jumperoo across the room. Um, so that is a concern as far as safety about that child flipping that um, jumperoo over. Um, and then when bumbo chairs have been placed on counters, children can flip out of them, the, um, off of those. Um, the jumperoos in doorways, the hooks on the moldings fall and can hit children on the heads. And then walkers can go down steps or be flipped over. Um, it's, I've had many a parent say to me, oh, I'm right there, I'm always with them, particularly with walkers, and I have um, seen a child who um, was in a walker when I got to somebody's home. Um, they had two steps between, to go down to a sunken living room, and that child went right off that step as we were standing there and flipped over. So it is not difficult to uh, flip those over. So, so these equipment have safety. So my question would be to come back to you regarding using equipment for safety is how are there other ways that you could set the children up in situations where they can be safe and out of equipment? So ways to promote development. So let's talk about that and please give your questions or comments and ways. Um, so um, you've all heard about this. Tummy time, tummy time, tummy time. This is a position that can be any position when the child is prone with their face down and, and tummy downward. Um, it develops head, neck, and back and hip muscles as well as using their arms to do that good pushing that we need, they need to get in and out of positions. So you can do it when you're carrying the child, um, lying on your caregiver's chest, um, using baby wear product, um, there's a lot of new baby wear that brings those hips out um, into a wide, out wide and wraps around the um, caregiver. Um, so um, then we can look at using play yards and pack and plays. And some of the nice things I've seen when I've gone to daycare centers is that they will have areas. Um, with play yards uh, or pack and play so that children are allowed to move in a safe environment um, and playing on the floor, allowing the child to move, being held and carried in the caregiver's arms. And then I'm just looking at um, your habits and like I was talking about how long should a child be in a piece of equipment, just really having a good un understanding and moving away from your habits of, of doing the container baby hop moving babies from one container to another container to another container, and making sure that they have time to move. So what I tell my moms that I work with that have, you know, that tend, particularly when babies start to sit, once they start to sit, most people just want to put them down and put them in sitting. And they might not have developed those good rolling skills yet or getting in and out of sitting or know how to get in and out of sitting. So I'll just remind that kid caregiver to every time they put the child down to um, put them down in a different position. So put them down on their side, put them down on their back, put them down on their tummy if they're sitting, you know, or if they don't want to stand quite yet because if, they, if they've gotten into that jumping to slowly move them onto their feet. So here, here's a nice picture of tummy time. So here's that baby. Whoops, we lost my tummy tuck picture. Okay. So here's that baby, and um, it's getting that nice push through the arms, lifting their head up, getting that nice extension through their back. This baby is probably about um, three or four months because their legs are still outward a little bit and not starting to um, go out straight. But you can see that she's... Um, and I'm assuming it's a she because there's a pink bib. Maybe, maybe it's not. Um, the baby is doing a nice job chewing, bringing those hands to midline, gaining that nice midline, con gaining that nice midline control there. So, what is what would be my vision of a perfect environment for babies is to have a space on the floor where they have toys and the caregivers are sitting on the floor with the children. This allows the children 
to um, be on their tummies, their backs, they're rolling, they're learning how to push. If the caregivers are sitting on the floor, they can use the caregivers to pull up on and to move. Or uh, you can also have soft structures or tables um, and allowing the child to pull up on. I work in one, I, <clears throat> I've worked in one daycare center where they had no tables. They just had a floor and they had no tables for the children that were um, in that 9 to 15 month range. And the children, uh, I asked them, I said, okay, so when the babies um, start to pull up, where do they do it? And they said they do it on them. So in that regard, it's somewhat good, but they didn't always spend a lot of time with the baby. So having small tables or things for the children to pull up on is really important So uh, during that time. Um, and if they are just having the jumperoos and other equipment that there's no place for them to pull up on, that can be dangerous also. Okay, so we're going to move on to... Um, oops, somebody's put my review. Um, so before I get it, pass this on to somebody else, I just would like to thank you for this opportunity to discuss container baby syndrome. Um, okay, one moment. Um, I'll get, I see there's a question. Let me get back to that. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss baby, container baby syndrome. I hope you can now reflect on how you use modern materials in your care of children and how can you provide a safe and um, playful environment for babies to move, explore, and become stronger. So the question is, what equipment would you recommend to allow babies to play outside in our play area? Um, I. I like any of the climbing structures. Um, hmm, off the top of my head, I like riding toys, um, you know, because they can, and these are kids that are already walking, I'm assuming, or is that what you're talking about, kids that are walking? Um, trikes are great. So you want to know on the lawn. Okay. So on the lawn, um, well, I guess just things that they, it just depends on the age um, of the child. So um, I guess I would use like, I'm picturing the little, um, and this is my, designing outdoor spaces is not my expertise, but I, you know, like, if if we're looking for things that they can climb on, so nice things that they can climb on, um, so the, maybe the little tight structures, um, again, you have to be right with them because you want to make sure that they're safe. Um, but you can put a blanket down and just be with them on, on, the, on the lawn. I think that's fine. And... So please, the question is, please tell us about baby wear. Um, so, so baby wear. So, again, um, um, so when babies, when you wear a baby, like in, um, all right, I'm trying to think of the names. Um, Ergo baby or even Baby Bjorn. So the Baby Bjorns I don't particularly like because, again, the baby is hanging and they've got that intense um, hanging right at the bottom of the pelvis. Um, and tends that hanging there tends to make the children sometimes scissor their leg, which is not great for their hips. So what I noticed when I went up to the... Um, to see the Cherry Blossom Festivals this past weekend, that they now, some of the baby wear that faces outward has added a piece to bring the hips out wide into abduction, so bringing those hips out wide. So they have a more um, surface area to, to, for them to be placed on. Um, so the, the ones that go against the chest are great, against the back. It gives that nice input to the body, and they feel the body moving and getting that input there. Um, okay. hope that answers that question. All right. Again, thank you so much, and I'm going to 
pass this on to Lee. Thank you so Lee. much, Molly. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. I think we have learned so many new things, and you've answered some really great questions today. Um, the in review is up, and those are the things that we have reviewed over today. You've defined and identified modern materials. You've defined and identified container baby syndrome. You reviewed and discussed how modern materials and container baby syndrome are related to the child care program, and reviewed and discussed strategies to promote development without using modern materials. Um, moving to the next slide, I wanted everybody to know that the handouts and evaluations are available now on the website. And the handouts are tummy time ideas that parents and caregivers can use to make the most of tummy time with their infants. Please make sure you complete the evaluation form and mail, email, fax to the address on the form to receive a training certificate and be entered into the raffle. This is what the website will look like, and while you are on www.vaittsnettwork.org, please make sure you click on the Professional Development tab, and you can find links to the tips calendar, and it will show uh, professional development opportunities. Also, there are ITSN trainings listed, such as the 123 Read Emergent Literacy Trainings, the Celebrating Babies and Toddlers Annual Workshops, and CEPL Social and Emotional Trainings are listed. To register on any of these trainings, just click on their tab. The raffle, if you will submit your completed evaluation form by April 27, 2018, to be entered, winners will be notified by email. And I'd also like to let you know that the upcoming webinar is May 17, charting the professional development course of infant and toddler caregivers. And I see down here, I'll go back over the certificate. We had a question here. Let's go back. Okay, the evaluation is on the website. And when you fill out the evaluation, mail it, email it, or fax it to the address, and once it has been received, you will receive a training certificate. So we have to have that evaluation filled out and sent in to us one of these ways before we can get the training certificate back to you. I hope that answered the question. I'll turn the volume up. Um, any other questions before we close? All right. Do any of the other presenters have anything else to add before we conclude? There's a question about where on the website is the evaluation? And Crystal, Leslie, do you have an answer? Because I'm not looking at that screen at this time. Um, on if you go to the Infant and Toddler Specialist Network website, the va-itsnetwork.org, um, then you are able to navigate to the webinars, and they will be loaded there. Yeah. Oh, okay. there's somebody under, making a really cool circle right I there. I see. Under the professional development, it is the third, I think, down of the webinar, and then it opens up another window, and it takes you right to it. Yeah. So under that professional development tab, it will have the evaluation form there.
And we have to receive that. Remember, and the mailing address is on that form. So don't stress if you don't know where the mailing address is. It's literally right on that form. So, um, okay, great. And then you can Messy win a raffle. Found it. Great. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for everything today. All right, I think that answers all the questions. Everybody seems to be finding it. Thank you also for uh, spending the time with us, and thank you for your participation. And this concludes the webinar.